Pete and Peter H. Um, a lot of you probably don't know who I am, but I'm just another one of the sort of ringers that have been around the Father's house for a few years. And I just wanted to share a few thoughts with you before we have communion. Um, a few of you that know me <coughs> pretty well would probably be surprised to find out that I have people in my life that don't like me. <laughs> You're supposed to go, oh, really? <laughs> How is that possible? Um, and just to share a short story with you, one of them was when I used to, Stacey and I, my wife here, used to have a bakery in Newcastle. Uh, we sold it about three years ago, and we went through a really hard time um, where we nearly lost the business. Um, it was a real struggle for quite a few years. And um, what we didn't know was we had somebody that worked for us that we thought was a real, almost family member was stealing off us. Um, and they stole it, probably up to 300, maybe more, $300,000. At the same time, uh, she was telling people in the shop that were coming in that I was actually propositioning her out the back. Uh, she was giving away food and you know, all sorts of things. But we had no idea it was her until probably about three weeks after she left. And um, when I was doing the figures up and I said to Stokes one day, it looks like it was her. And she went, what? And I said, yeah, because the figures are up like thousands of dollars a week. Um, so she, we, when we look back, there's a lot of reasons that we, we should have picked up on it. But, you know, her eyes were blind to the fact that we just thought she was an honest person. But she really must have hated us because she, she brought our family to its knees for a long time. And um, it just reminded me of uh, the, when Jesus was having one of his last, last meals, one of the last meals with his, with his disciples. And he knew that he was going to be betrayed. He knew that um, Peter was going to deny him. He knew that the disciples were going to scatter and just leave him on his own. But when he actually announced to them that um, Judas would betray them, they were all in like, well, it's not going to be me, is it? Like, he loved them so much and so perfectly that they had no idea who the disciple was until he told them. It wasn't like, you know, he said, I oh, wanted you to betray me, and they went, no. Well, it's just Judas, if you've seen the way he talks to him, he might leave. He's really not one of his close friends here. They just had no idea. And it made me think, if I'd have been told in advance that, hey, it's actually, well, I can say her name, Beck, her name was. Beck's actually the one stealing off him, and she's the one telling all customers that, you know, your proposition here, and she was doing all this other stuff behind your back, I would have had a really hard time just going, oh, nice to see you this morning, Ben. Like, it's great to, great to have you on board. I wouldn't have shown her the love that um, I couldn't show her actually for quite a long time. Uh, it took a long time to get over that and forgive her, but um, I just wanted to encourage you as we come and take communion together just to concentrate on the love of Jesus because his love was just so perfect and so pure that by the way he treated his disciples, nobody had any idea which one of them was going to betray him until they were told by name. And even when he did it and told them, he still just said to Judas, what you're about to do, do quickly. Not, why don't you just get the hell out of here and like, you low life piece of scum. Yeah. He, he treated him beautifully until the end. So let's just... Um, share communion together and just concentrate on how Jesus loved us like he loved them.
How's that, maybe? How's that, Maddie? Hello, hello, hello. This here is known as the Smith Row. <laughs> Smith family. Row, that is, right? <laughs> and what I've noticed about the Smith family is her eldest daughter, Eleanor, if she gets any taller, her mother's gonna get a neck strain looking up at her. A wonderful family. Good to see them here. I talk tonight. That's not working, is it, Rob? No, no. Are you having some tech? It's been a good day, hasn't it, really? Lovely day. Great day. Lovely day. Great day for It's my hat causing you to go on there. Oh, praise God. I'm going to talk tonight on demonic strongholds. Um, this is a prophetic subject that everyone in this room should walk in. You should know these things. You should be able to operate in these things. They should just be like breathing to you. See, I, I got baptised in the Spirit and... And I went to a, um, a, a Franciscan church, right, down at Edgecliff. And the guy who prayed for me was called Spooky Luke. That's what they called him. Which is an unusual name for a priest, really. But he was spooky. And I walked up the front and he put a hand on me head and said, receives the Holy Spirit. He said, now you've got it. Well, I can tell you something, I felt like I've got nothing. I went back the same way that I went up the front. But over the course of the next few weeks, I began to know things about people, see things over people, in my own prayer life. You know, just, uh, and I say this, since it's just to see angels as, as being commonplace things, not anything unusual. Now I didn't know they weren't commonplace until I talked to other people who weren't having the same experience, right? So I just thought it was like naturally like breathing. Now I can tell you, beloved, we live in a time where never has the Christian church been more commissioned by God to cast the demons out of people. The world is under the influence of evil. We see it. We see people walking down the street muttering to themselves. We see people who are driving cars who if you if you made a mistake they're gonna dump out the car and kill you. We see women being assaulted regularly and murdered and hurt and all this sort of evil that rises up and we think that there's nothing spiritual in it. You can go to a counsellor. They cannot counsel a demon out of you. They can only be cast out by a believer or by, by yourself or by a believer. They can't be cast out by a counsellor. They can't be talked around. They don't have a good side. There's no good side to them. And so we see, and I've seen over many years, Tanya and I ran a street ministry for many years in Parramatta where we had a guy who believed he was a canary. This is true. And he'd dress in yellow 
and he'd stand on the seat and he'd flap his arms and try and fly. Now, guess what? He never flew. Never flew once. I don't know what he would have done if he had a flame, but he never did. <laughs> but you know this guy, over time, he would, he would, he would contact me and say, I see you come down on Friday nights and you get here early. He said, I'd like to, I'd like to make you dinner. Mm. And so for many weeks, this guy who thought he was a canary would make me dinner. Now there were plenty of people came to that meeting who didn't think they were a canary and never offered me a meal once. And I've learned, I've learned from hard experience that I know how to deal with the demonic because I've had to deal with a lot in my own life. So, I come to God, I'm in a mental hospital, I'm told I'll never work again. Tanya has called in and said he'll never work again. You better prepare yourself because he's not going to be coming home. And I fell on my face I can smell the carpet. I can smell the place. That's because it was pretty smelly. <laughs> I can smell the place. And I can remember. And God came to me. And what happened was, hope in me. They said I'd never work again. Three weeks later, I was back at work. So, and that's something I have in the bank. right? That's in the bank. That can never be stolen from me. It can never be watered down. You don't have to believe it, but it happened to me. And I believed it, and it's worked for me. In Psalm 21, in Psalm 22, it says, The wise conquer a city of warriors and bring down the mighty fortress. Again, a wise man attacks a city and pulls down the strongholds in which they trust. In Amos 6, 8 it says, I detest his fortresses and I will hand over the city and everyone in it. We are getting positioned for a demolition of works of the enemy that have been created in people over centuries, over centuries, over thousands of years. My grandfather was a, an Englishman who came to Australia to be part of the Candos Cement Works. And he had expertise in the building of kilns in which to process the limestone to be able to build, uh, to be able to present, uh, produce cement. Now, when he came here, he is a Cockney, so he has a strong British accent, and he is on the staff at the cement works. One day, people in the cement works, in order for him to gain acceptance among the executives, he was asked to attend a meeting of the Masonic Lodge, which he did, and became a master mason. Now, he didn't think he was doing his family any harm. He, he, didn't, do, he didn't join in order to harm his family. He joined in order to be able to get access to different levels of management. Because all the top echelon in the in the cement works were from the lodge. People who joined the Masonic Lodge, which many people in Australia have that in their history, they make a vow that their tongue be torn out from the roof of their mouth and planted where the high tide reaches the low tide and if they divulge any of these secrets. And they evoke, by these prayers and the different things they do, they invoke a curse on their family. So what we see, we see aspects of a curse. What do we see? Repeated um, uh, childlessness. We see repeated feminine problems in women that, that are there with no clear diagnosis. We see, um, we see business failure. We, pe we receive repetitive illness. We see marital breakdown. We see continual financial lack where there shouldn't be. We'll see those things there. Tanya and I went and ministered to a family in South Australia 
where they had nine children and eight of the children had thyroid cancer and came from a curse that was on the family. And that curse came because they saw a, a child they adopted which ended up uh, abusing every one of the children, sexually abusing every one of the children, had seen his father murdered in the hallway of the house. He, sorry, he, he shot himself in the hallway of the house. These things that we see happening, they impact us. And if they're not dealt with, they'll impact us for centuries. They'll keep impacting us. Because, beloved, if I go back further, far, far enough in your family, there'll be... Uh, Incidents where people were unholy and ungodly and rejected God and lived a pagan lifestyle. That's just the way it is. And every time people keep drawn into that same behaviour, we perpetuate it. The sins of the fathers are passed on to the children. Curses, and they provide a stronghold, a foothold by which demonic activity can be uh, access in our life. I, um, at the moment, have prayed for a man who has suffered tremendous rejection. Do you think he's Robinson Crusoe? Do you think he's the only person who suffered rejection? I'm not asking for a show of hands because I can tell you what, all of us in this room have suffered rejection of one sort or another and some really harsh, hard rejection. Some painful things we've had to go through. Some things where it's like Tim talks about a business reversal. Will you imagine what it was like when he couldn't feed his own family? Where he's working from four o'clock in the morning and can't get enough money together to pay his bills. Pretty hard to go through that without resentment, do you think, when you find out who it is? You'd, find, you'd feel like aiming your car at them if you saw them in the street. Not that he would do that. Yeah, I bought a two cars. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, you see, you see, I went to work one day with people I was working with and found out they stole all my money. People I remember stole everything. And I went to a, a meeting out at uh, Maru Conference Centre and there was an Aboriginal prophetic person there called Kinder Greeny. And out of the meeting, before I knew anything about it, he said, the Lord has opened a new chapter in your life, a new beginning. This is the prophetic word. I go home and have stolen all my money. <laughs> so it was, a, it was a new beginning. But the enemy seeks to build a stronghold in your life. And if you imagine within your life, surrounded by a moat of fear, strongholds can be built. And you're afraid to allow God to assail them because the enemy will use fear, hurts, curses, uh, uh, soul, spirit hurts against you that are the, they, they are the mortar that hold the bricks of a stronghold together. So those things never dealt with and they'll be there holding, holding it together. When I first uh, came to God, Someone was talking about demons at a meeting I was at. And I was sick in the stomach and I, I, and, and I felt uncomfortable. I couldn't sit comfortably. And after the meeting, I went up and said, I might have some of this <laughs> to the people who were leaving it. And in those days, you didn't have to give people much encouragement, I could tell you. So they turned up to pray for me, Michael. One had, each one had a bucket in their hand. I didn't know what that was. That was actually to vomit them up, really. <coughs> now, I can tell you now, if I deliver, if I need deliverance now, I can be delivered without even a shout, without even a, without nothing. 
because I give no demon permission to manifest in my body. Amen. No manifest. <coughs> no nonsense. Just take your bags and get out and go home to where Jesus has prepared for you to go. Amen. No nonsense. No mucking around. Amen. And uh, <coughs> but these things will build a um, will build strongholds in your life of fear, of shame, of control in your life, where you feel like you have to control everything. And when you have no true control over anything, you then will control a few people around you to, make, to, to keep them in check. And the devil will want you to be ashamed of yourself because you never feel forgiven. Because he wants to take you to... The memorial stones he's built in your life of your past sins, your past failures, the past times when you feel like God has not answered prayer, he'll build a memorial stone and then he'll have you visit, visiting your own inner cemetery of your own failures. And he'll take you there and remind you. At that time, you need to remind him of his future. Because his future will be nowhere near you. And, and, and it will pressure you to the point where you wish you were dead. You wish you were dead. You'll have suicidal thoughts. And in those suicidal thoughts, you can open yourself up to real diseases. If you wish you were dead, he'll come along and give you a terminal disease. Or <coughs> and I'll give you a life where you're struggling. You'll know if you've got a stronghold because your life would have come to a halt. You'll feel like you're making no progress. You'll feel like you're butting your head up against the wall. You'll feel like you feel entrapped. Now, you won't always be able to name what it is, but the symptoms, symptoms, the symptoms will be no progress. One of the ways that the enemy has a go at us is by the use of fiery darts. Say with me, fiery darts. In Ephesians 6, it gives a description of Roman armour. And at the end, in verse 16, it says... And above all, take up the shield of faith. All these weapons of armour are, are moderated and operated by faith. You can be holding that shield of faith and you'll hear whistling over the, over the country coming towards you a fiery dart. And the, the, the idea of the fiery dart is not that it just penetrates you and leaves you alone. It penetrates you with something that is lasting, a scar that spreads out from where it's hit you. These fiery darts can be words. They can be incantations of evil spirits. They can be lots and lots of things. But they want you, they want you not to remember to extinguish these flaming arrows. See, Craig can get hit by a fiery dart, so it's only one dart. It's only one dart. Oh, well, now it's two. Now it's five. Sometimes your shield can get so heavy with fiery darts <clears throat> that it takes a bit of effort to shake them off. To shake them off on the ground and stamp them into nothing. The shield of faith. It has to become a daily habit. I put on the armour of God. I have it on now because I don't take it off. Amen. There are no instructions in the Bible. There's no Ephesians 7, which is, is, is there to take off your armour. No, Amen. you put the armour on. Amen. So you put on what? The helmet of salvation. That is the realisation that we are saved by grace through faith. We are saved. And that's one of the greatest things you can ask God for. And start to accept that you are righteous. Not by your behaviour, by, but by imputation from the cross. Amen. You are made righteous. Mm -hmm. You're not trying to be righteous. You are righteous. 
He had to struggle to be righteous. The death of Jesus Christ and the wounds that he suffered on the way to Calvary, the seven places where he shed his blood, they paid the price for your sins and every curse that would ever be put against you because it is written, cursed is he who hangs on the tree. So you, you it's the realisation. See, the word occult means to obscure. So the enemy wants to obscure from you the truth that God would want you to have. It has to become a daily habit. We walk through life armoured up. And we stop only to stop incoming missiles coming against us. And that mostly these are the words of people around us. They're words and stuff that happen. I'll talk about a few common fiery darts and how we deal with them and how, how do we quench things. Forget this is a great quenching agent when we forgive. And we start off by being willing to forgive. Amen. If someone has deeply hurt you, it's not easy to say, oh, I forgive them, and everything changes on the inside. Someone hurt you over years. And the problem is, the people mostly can become repeat offenders. Mm -hmm. They keep doing it. If they do it once and leave you alone, it wouldn't be as bad, but they can do it over and over and over and over again. I couldn't tell you how many times my own mother has hurt, my own mother hurt me. And, uh, and sometimes it was intentional. So if someone, if, if Mary hits Pete, Pete's uh, toe with a hammer and says, sorry, darling, he limps around for a few days, but he does forgive her. But the minute his toe's getting better, if she gives him another whack and then another whack and another whack and another whack, in the end, she won't find his toe. It'll be so far under the chair that she'll never find it. She'll never find it. <laughs> See, if, if the enemy can get you into an area where you um, where you pull back from supernatural revelation, you won't know what's happening. The spiritual gifts are given to us because we need them. Yeah. We need them. We're told to. We're told to earnestly pursue the spiritual gifts. And we, we're carrying around a toolbox called the paraclete, the one who's called alongside the help. The image in the Greek is two people carrying a log and the Holy Spirit's got the heavy end. So we work in cooperation with the Holy Spirit, the paraclete. And um, and the shield of faith is how we operate the gifts. If you don't know what God wants, how can you do it? If you don't know the direction for your life, how do you know you're not going backwards? See, but solid food is for the mature, for those whose senses have been trained to distinguish good from evil. God wants us to be able to grow in the gift of discernment. Discernment is the gift that's most missing from the church. We just went through a series of COVID where the church was silent about everything. Where it gave, gave no leadership to people. I, I uh, and Tanya and I as pastors of this church, we wanted to give people leadership, but we found it difficult in the sense that the Catholic Church, the Anglican Church, the Methodist, none of them said anything. Whatever the government said, they said, yes, sir, yes, sir, three bags full. <coughs> and we still don't know what the truth is. As you pray, you sharpen your spiritual senses and you can flow in. This is easy to flow in 
because of this because of the shield of faith faith comes by hearing and hearing the word of god so you need god to open your ears put a finger on each ear now i decree and declare now an opening of your spiritual sense of hearing in jesus name where there are blockages because of fear because of shame because of words evil words spoken over you i break that off you now may you hear the voice of god with new clarity in jesus name amen as you come and as you ask god as you ask the holy spirit it says leads us into all truth and the truth brings freedom now if you're not free you're not being led by the Spirit of God. He who is led by the Holy Spirit, these are the sons of God. You cannot sense the spirit of adoption where you know that you're a son and daughter of God if you're not being led by the Holy Spirit. How can you know? You can't know. So there has to be a leading, a surrendering, a yield. Because the Holy Spirit makes it work. The spiritual person, it says in 1 Corinthians 2.15, the spiritual person, however, can evaluate everything. Yet he himself cannot be evaluated by anyone. For who has known the Lord's mind that he may instruct him? But we have, listen to this, the mind of Christ. That's the actuality and potentiality of our walk with God. Your spirit becomes activated because we're spiritual beings and we can, we can all discern and evaluate all things. And don't be led into the trap because it says in Matthew, judge not, this lest you shall be judged. So we're not meant to be walking around like Inspector Clouseau finding fault with everyone. We're meant to judge on a big scale. See, when I, when I pray with people and when you pray with people, it would be quite common for you to see hooks coming out their back end somewhere. And those hooks will mean something. It would be quite common for you... Um, uh, they look like fish hooks. Each one represents a different, a different hook that the devil's got into someone. And you can pray simply for these things and just uh, command them in the name of Jesus to straighten out and you just pull them out of their back like that. Now I know that can sound weird, but you've never asked God what's holding someone back. But if you see someone with half a dozen fish hooks in their back, and lines going off into the ether somewhere, you know they're being held back. And if they don't come out easily, you wait and in the spirit pray for them to straighten up. It's a it, it's a it's an area where the devil has hooked them. It says in the book of Job, I have hooked them. I've hooked you with a hook in your mouth. That's the, the evil ones, a, a spirit of Leviathan, like a crocodile thing, and, uh, and uh, it hooks people in the mouth to interfere with communication. So that Mary will say one thing and Peter will hear another. There'll be miscommunication because of demonic interference not because there's any intentionality to, to hide something from each other. Mm. If I have forgiven anything, it's for you. <clears throat> if I have forgiven anything, it is for you in the presence of Christ so that we may be not Sorry, that we may not, not be taken advantage of by Satan, for we are not ignorant of his intentions and schemes. I can understand 
that Satan can get hooks in it. I've had in my life some, some, some really tough, hurtful things done to me. I've had a few people steal large amounts of money and that's been good, that's been easier things, but I've had some, I have had some really hard, painful things done. One thing took me several years to get over and um, where I was hurt by a group of people and it took me several years to get over it. And Tim, I, I, feel, I thought I was over it until I began to speak about them. I can hear the, heard the vehemence in my voice. I was almost spitting while I talked about it. But you, you touch me now, there's nothing there. It's been dealt with. Often hooks are in us because they, uh, they uh, relate to forgiveness. And we have to ask God to remove the hook and to help and to help us forgive. We start by being willing, by saying, Lord, I'm willing to forgive. I don't feel anything, but I ask you to help me forgive. And these can, things can become ancestors. I know in my grandfather's case, when he became a mason, here's the fruit in his family from becoming a mason. My oldest, my, uh, his oldest son died of inoperable cancer after having his eye removed, denying God on his deathbed. His next son went missing, left the family, estranged, never came back. Early death, one daughter, alcoholic. Another son murdered in an alcoholic halfway house, alcoholic. Uh, my mother an alcoholic who married an alcoholic, my grandfather was an alcoholic. And when my grandfather, when my grandfather died, we didn't know about the Masonic Lodge until we went to the funeral and saw that they turned up and gave him the Masonic funeral, all of that, and laid aprons on his coffin. Oh, we never knew of that. My grandfather, however, was an alcoholic who loved my father. He hated Catholics. My father was a Catholic, but he loved my father because my father got him to AA and got him off the drink. So rather than got drunk together, they, they became good friends. My grandfather used to go to auctions with my father and he was a, he was a sucker. So they'd bring on a box, a mystery box. He'd be buying it and taking it home. And I remember that once he bought a box of horseshoe nails. <laughs> like when I say a box, I'm talking about something a metre cubed. That had to be put on a truck by crane. <laughs> my grandfather is there and he's living with my parents. He had a stroke. And then um, he's lying in bed and my mother's holding his hand and just praying for him. He sat up. He said, take me home, Jesus. Put his arms out and lay down and died. A curse broken, a curse broken by the love of his, my mother and father towards him. He was loved by other people too. But they demonstrated to him a living faith. My parents had a living, living faith where uh, like my father believed in simple belief and being changed. Sometimes we have to make sure that we're standing in the, in the place of authority where we have authority to remove a hook. Because if the person wants a hook, you're not going to remove it. Some people don't want to be free. You can't free people against their will. 
Often when you pray for people, you'll see bands around their head, particularly if they've got persistent migraines or things like that, you'll see like a steel band around their head and it'll have like a tightening device on the side of it. Sometimes screws into the head. And that illustrates different ways that the devil has infiltrated people's minds. He drops a thought bomb into your mind as a fiery dart and there it is, it'll consume you. What if, what if my wife is having an affair? What if my husband's having an affair? What about this? What about that? What about this? Often indicates um, alcohol involvement if you see uh, screws in people's heads and things like that. The legal ground can be reclaimed because we're all owned by God. So part of us can't be owned by the devil if the whole deal is owned by God. It's a matter of reclaiming. The Holy Spirit, um, the Holy Spirit is all about ownership. Where the family, family can, we, we know different cases. Tanya and I prayed for a, a young woman. Uh, she had, she, she had, she kept fiddling with a ring, like a little gold ring on her. Yeah. We said, um, and we said, what's, what's that about? Well, when she was of a Mediterranean heritage, <coughs> and when she was a little girl, she wasn't well. So they took that ring mm. to a woman with the gift of the evil eye in the village, which is a witch, and had it prayed over and put it back on her. She was studying at university, but could never get the last year finished. She just failed, have a breakdown. We took that ring off and smashed it with a hammer. She's now been a, a teacher for more than 40 years. We prayed for another man. We prayed for this man who was covered in uh, grief. He was just crying and crying all the time because he had a, a girlfriend who broke up with him. And he couldn't get over it. And you can't sort of say to people, well, put your big boy pants on and go out and don't cry. You know, there's something going on. And he was playing with the ring too. We got him to take the ring on off the back and said, with my undying love from so-and-so. Well, she gave her undying love to someone else. So we took the ring off him and smashed it. And he's married with lots and lots of kids now. I'm very happy. So there are things that we can bring home with us. We know somebody who, would, who went to a mental hospital every year for 15 years. She was a missionary. And on her mantelpiece, when we went into her house, were several polished stones. And they were used by a witch doctor in ceremonies. And she brought them home as a keepsake. But when they were smashed with a hammer, She's never been to a mental hospital since. Yeah. We touch the darkness, the darkness will touch us. Yeah. True. If you listen to the music and you listen to what's going on in the world, certain woke ideology, you can't touch that stuff with a 40-foot pole. Amen. You're going to bring home more than you want. Amen. So, we need to, as we get rid of stuff, we, we, we number one, we repent for our part in it. We repent on behalf of our um, of behalf of our ancestors and we separate ourselves and we pray prayers to break what's going on. Okay, I am going to finish soon, I hope. I'm just looking for a place to land. <laughs> <laughs> Have a look at my oh, I'm not bad, okay. One of the things that I've seen on people over many years, right, are yokes. Like they yoke oxen together. 
And I said to God, what's this about? And he talked about that we should not be unequally yoked to anybody. So, if a believing wife marries an unbelieving husband and she does that knowledgeably, she can struggle all her life with that until that yoke's removed. Uh, one of the most common yokes, oh, I just want to put your hands on your shoulders, I should like this. Just indulge me. We're going to move, move off you the yoke of false responsibility. The devil will often make us feel responsible for people that we can't change and we're not responsible to try and get them to change. They're not our responsibility. And if you heard me teach on boundaries, they're not in our hoop. So you don't take responsibility for them. Okay. Now, I decree, I, I, I decree and declare now that the yoke of false responsibility be broken off you now in Jesus' name. Amen. I break that yoke in Jesus' name into a thousand pieces. I lift the weight of false responsibility off you in the name of Jesus and declare the healing power of his shed blood. Thank you, Lord. The very name Christ means yoke-destroying, burden-lifting power. In his very name. You thought it was his surname. No, it's his. It's his yoke-destroying, burden-lifting power. You'll see people often carrying a, back, a, a black sack. As you pray with people, you scan them. Just have a good look at them. See what's going on around them. Because our spirit reaches out beyond us. You see? So you just break, command the black sack to be gone. Sometimes you'll see a cloud around people. where You'll find their thinking is foggy. You'll see a cloud of bats you'll find their thinking is batty and confused. Snakes are never good. If you see snakes around people, not good. See a python, it'll be squeezing the life out of someone. You see leeches sucking the life out of people. You must have your spiritual eyes open because to see these things you know how to pray. I've prayed with many people where you see an umbilical cord that stretches beyond them and it goes back and back and back and you know you're dealing then with generational issues. You see, for example, endometriosis and things like that. These are things that we have seen hundreds of times heal. Because they're from a curse of barrenness. They're from, they're from things where the devil wants to put his nose in the natural bodily functions where expectations should be natural and normal and easy. Just put your hands over your eyes. I'll say this prayer to finish. Otherwise, you think you're never going home then. <laughs> this is important to me, very important, because the role of this church and the ongoing role of this church when you find you have some drama happening, you ask, oh, well, why do I exist? Well, we exist to help people who are harried and hassled by demons, who find no peace, who have no answers, who suffer from deep rejection. The broken of the world are our congregation. I pray now for your spiritual eyes to be open. I pray for the scales to fall off your eyes in the name of Jesus. I pray now for things that your eyes have seen that have saw it scorch your spirit, that have shocked you, that have hurt you. 
I pray for those things to be healed in the name of Jesus. Yes. I release 2020 spiritual vision in the name of Jesus. Amen. 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 I recommend that you get a book by Kenneth Connor, uh, Shapes and Types of in the Bible which will let you know what you're looking at. Sometimes you see, if, with a bit of study, see, sometimes you don't know what you're seeing. You know, if I say to you, the book of Revelations is not the book of hid hiddenness, it's the book of Revelations. A lot of people read Revelations and get confused. It's not confused at all. But you're meant to understand it. So, but shapes and, shapes and types in the Bible or any good prophetic dis dictionary will give you, by the prophetic dictionary by Jennifer LeClaire or something like that, will give you what this what this shape means. Like, if you see like the number twelve, you have a dream. You see number twelve. You see number twelve on someone's uh, um, forehead. Is that a good number? A bad number? What does it mean, number? Well, with a simple dictionary, you know what it means. And once you know it, you know it. The, the Bible tells us what's been revealed to us belongs to us. Once it's been revealed to us. So you're not meant to walk around with your spiritual eyes shut. You're meant to walk around with them open. I thank you very much for coming today. I thank you for the honour that I felt today. I pray God would bless you and his blessings would overtake you and never leave you. Amen. Thanks, Thanks. Thanks.